Welcome to Simple Entomology for the Fly Tire and Fly Fisherman Part 8. I'm Raj Kletke and today we'll be looking some more at caddis. In the previous video, Caddis 1, we talked about recognizing caddis and spent most of our time talking about tying and fishing the caddis larva. Today we'll move on to the caddis pupa and also talk about the term ferret adult, which you will see in caddis literature. Technically, the larva becomes a pupa when it sheds its larval skin. It does this within a protective enclosure, which goes by variable names as listed here. The case-carrying larva will anchor its case in a protective area in the stream bed and then seal both ends, making the pupa case the same as its larval case. Many of the retreat case larva or net spinning larva will modify one of their cases while, of course, the free living caddis larva needs to make its shelter from scratch. The pupa shelters are usually placed in protective areas in the stream, and so while the organism pupates, it is not readily available to trout and therefore not of major interest to the trout fishermen. However, when the organism leaves the pupa shelter, it is of major importance to the trout fishermen. When the organism leaves the pupa shelter, it is a fully formed adult, although somewhat constricted within a covering. This fully formed adult is technically known as a ferret adult. To the fly fisherman, the covering is usually known as a pupa skin or sheath as it's covering the organism, as a shuck as it's being shed from the organism, and as an exuvia once it is shed from the organism. We'll keep it simple and use the common fly fishing terminology. When the organism leaves the pupa case, we will refer to it as a pupa with a pupa skin. It'll remain a pupa into the early stage emerger. So technically this is a ferret adult, but for us we will call it a pupa and these are the shed pupa skins. So let's get ready to tie a caddis pupa. As always, we have to make a decision of whether we're tying for opportunistic feeding or selective feeding. Most of the organisms that we've tied on these simple entomology videos, trout have taken opportunistically, so an illusion of life was the most important tying consideration. However, I believe caddis pupa are taken predominantly in a selective fashion, which brings up other tying considerations. Let's take a closer look at selective feeding. We've already looked at this important trout feeding rule and know that when trout are feeding opportunistically, they often waste energy by taking in non-food matter. If a trout can recognize a feature that guarantees that what they're taking in is food, they do not have to waste this energy. We commonly refer to these recognizable features as triggers. Trout only have the luxury of selective feeding when food is abundant, but caddis pupa are abundant as they leave their shelters in a synchronized fashion. This has survival advantage to the caddis pupa as their sheer numbers overwhelm the ability of trout or birds to eat them. The caddis pupa will often emerge when there are other insects available to the trout also. Additionally, even the pupa has several substages that the trout may key in on. So the trout does have to make choices. Just like everybody at a banquet may not choose the exact same meal, trout, even in the same location of the stream, may not choose the exact same organism or stage of a particular organism. Even if eating the exact same meal or same stage of an organism, people and trout may be doing it for different reasons or triggers. You may choose this meal because of fries while someone else chooses it because of the burger. These are different triggers. When we tie flies, we try to put in as many triggers as possible, but what triggers trout to feed is an inexact science. Nevertheless, I feel that currently Hewitt's factors are the best list of triggers and a reasonable order of importance. So let's look at how we can control these factors. Some of these features are best controlled with our presentation. What water type and where in the water column. We want to fish the flies controlled predominantly by our casting. Additionally, during our cast and after the cast, we may manipulate the fly causing variable behavior. 
Our tying also controls many of these factors. We can use heavy hooks and even weight the hooks if we want to fish the fly near the bottom. Our choice of materials also affects the micro movement or behavior of the fly, light effects, and size, shape, and color are obviously controlled by our tying. So let's tie some flies that we can use as a caddis pupa. Note this particular caddis pupa has long flowing and numerous appendages which would move in the currents. This should bring to mind the possibility of using a soft hackle, a fly that is very easy to tie and very effective. The caddis pupa will generally be one to two hook sizes smaller than the caddis larva. So while I'm tying this on a size 14 hook for clarity, I usually tie these on 14, 16, 18s, and even sometimes as small as 20. You'll note that I've already put dubbing on the thread and have a wire rib in place. I've also left a little bit of bare hook near the eye of the hook. The dubbing I like is very spiky and usually has some antron in it. As you saw in the caddis pupa, it has a much fatter body than what we tied in the midge soft hackle, and therefore I make a much fatter body on this particular fly. The colors I use are the same as the larval colors, varying from bright green to olive, tan to brown, and gray to black. Once I have the body in place, I do the usual four to five extra wraps of the thread. So when I reverse wind the ribbing, I'm at the correct tie-in point. When I have that wire tied in place, I usually break it off rather than cut it off as this saves my scissors. At that point, I need to make a decision about the hackle. In this particular case, I have a hackle which is far too big to wind in the classical fashion, although usually on a size 14 you can find an appropriate hackle. But again, I'll use the distribution wrap by cutting out the center stem, measuring for length, pinching the vertically accumulated fibers on the far side and using the thread tension to bring those fibers around that small bare area at the front of the hook. On the smaller flies, this extra hackle will usually break off, but on a larger fly like this, sometimes it'll have to be cut off. Once it is cut off, you can simply make the head in the usual fashion and whip finish the fly. The soft hackles provide the movement of the pupa appendages and the relatively fat body with antron fibers collects small bubbles of air giving the light effect that is important in a caddis pupa. For even greater trapping of air bubbles and therefore more light effect we tie Gary LaFontaine sparkle pupa. It is usually tied in two patterns, a deep pattern and a superficial pattern. I'll be tying a superficial pattern here, but if I was tying a deep pattern, I would use a heavy hook, put weight on the hook, and would leave off the shuck that's at the back of the hook. Once I have my thread at the back of the hook, I put on one strand that is doubled of sparkle yarn. One strand doubled is about perfect for a size 14 hook. I have to split that sparkle yarn smaller if I'm tying the 16s, 18s, and 20s. You'll note that I have not combed out the sparkle yarn at this time. I then add the dubbing that will form the body of what represents the ferret adult. The color of this dubbing would be similar to what we used on the soft hackle. I like very spiky dubbing with antron as this also helps to hold on to air bubbles and trap air. The theory is that the gas bubbles that separate the pupa skin from the ferret adult and cause the pupa to rise to the surface 
tend to have a tremendous light effect that the trout can see at quite a distance and use as a major trigger. Once I have the ferret adult body dubbing in place or the underbody, it's time to comb out the overbody, which is my sparkle yarn. I'm using green here, and I do commonly use green, although a clear Antron sparkle yarn is also a good choice, as the pupa skin itself is, of course, very clear. I use a toothbrush to comb this out, but you can use a mustache brush. You can use almost anything as long as you get the fibers separated. I have to admit that I do have difficulty sometimes tying this fly, and it is usually related to a nice distribution of the outer body or bubble. Once I have the fibers all split, I bring them forward and I usually hold the fibers in my right hand and use my left hand to wrap the thread around twice. Once that's in place, you can sometimes get lucky and by simply taking the weight off the thread or loosening the thread, push the outer body fibers back, creating a bubble. If you're happy with that bubble, simply tie it tightly in place and continue. More commonly, however, this won't be evenly distributed and you'll have to go back, tighten your material again, and then use a needle to evenly pull and distribute the outer body into place until it forms a nice, even bubble. It does not have to be very aesthetically pleasing, except that it's more fun to fish with flies that you've tied yourself and are fairly proud of. Once you have the bubble the way you want it, simply clip off the excess sparkle yarn and tie that in place. If this was a deep sparkle pupa, I would then put side wings on. Usually I use fibers from a pheasant tail. I would put them on both sides and then put on a head, as will be seen in a little while. However, since this is a superficial sparkle pupa, I make a small bundle of hair, tapping it to get the ends even, measure for length, control my thread kick, cut the fibers off ahead of time. I like to pre-cut fibers and hold them in place tightly while I start the thread. Once I'm comfortable that I have the right length, I tie them tightly in place, and you could quit at this point. However, I like adding some darker dubbing, either dark brown or black, and making a slightly larger head. Again, I like using a spiky dubbing, as I think this does create some micro movement. Once I have the head dubbing in place, I tie off the thread and whip finish in the usual fashion. The internet has numerous videos with a variety of ways of tying both the superficial and deep sparkle pupa. There are many other good pupa patterns out there also, but it is worth your time learning to tie this sparkle pupa. Now that we've tied our caddis pupa for selective feeding, let's learn where and how we should fish it. The literature varies as to what happens to the pupa when it leaves its pupa shelter at the bottom of the stream. Some of this may be due to species variation. If the pupa leaves the area rapidly, it's of minimal interest to the fly fishermen, but some drift for long periods of time along the bottom and initially are of great interest to the fly fishermen. Of continuing interest to the fly fishermen are the pupa as they rise through the mid-currents. 
The speed at which they do this is partially dependent upon whether they rise predominantly from the gas bubbles that form between the ferret adult and the pupa skin, whether they swim, or whether they do a combination of both. Once near the surface, the pupa will drift for a variable period of time subsurface until it ultimately pops through the surface and emerges as a fully formed adult. At different times during the emergence, we'll want to fish our pupa deep in the mid-currents, subsurface, and possibly even at the surface. Whether we fish on a dead drift or with a swing is partially dependent upon the species we're trying to imitate. We know we're fishing the caddis pupa to selectively feeding trout, but we have not yet covered the all-important question of when to fish the caddis pupa. When to fish the caddis pupa is best discussed after we discuss the caddis adult and how to recognize a caddis hatch. We'll do this in the next video, Simple Entomology for the Fly Tire and Fly Fisherman, Part 9. See you soon.